Hi and welcome to a British audiophile and if you don't know me already my name is Taryn. Now the Danes have a fine tradition in loudspeaker design brands like Dali, Dyne Audio and driver manufacturer Scanspeak and from Norway we get Hegel amplifiers. Well what have their Nordic cousins the Finns got to offer? Spoiler alert, judging by this offering, quite a bit. Welcome to my review of the Amphion Argon Ones. You may want to strap yourself in and come along for this ride. The Amphion Argon Ones are a two-way base reflex rear ported design with a 25mm 1-inch titanium tweeter housed in a substantial waveguide. Bukar S400 style, but Amphion have been doing this for a lot longer, 20 years, and it's the fifth generation waveguide that we have here. It also features a 133mm or 5.25 inch aluminium mid base woofer. Both units are protected by mesh grills from prying fingers. It measures 315mm high, 160mm wide, and 265mm deep. Each unit weighs 8 kilograms. It's available for 1200 pounds in black. There's also a standard white finish and a full white finish. And for 100 pounds extra, you get the walnut that I have here today. There's various colored grill options available as well. It's an elegant, non-imposing looking speaker with a slim silhouette. One of the main issues with using a metal mid-bass woofer is that if you allow it to play up too high, it starts ringing and it has sharp breakup nodes and that's an unpleasant kind of distortion. Now, one of the solutions to this is that you have the crossover point a little bit lower and that's what you have essentially in the Amphion Argon Ones. The crossover point is at 1600 hertz. Normally on a two-way design, you'd expect it to be around 2K. The crossover itself is an interesting design. Amphion's approach is to use minimal high quality parts in the crossover network itself. Now I couldn't get confirmation as to whether they use first order or second order filters. I suspect it's one of those two judging by the number of parts actually on the crossover board. And just to be clear, a first order filter will cause the drivers to roll off at 6 dB per octave a second order filter at 12 dB per octave, third order would be 18, and the fourth order would be 24. It's a valid approach that they have here. The idea is by having as few passive components, especially capacitors and inductors, which are non-linear devices when it comes to adding distortion, by having as few of those in the signal path as possible, you're minimizing the distortion that they add and also the problems that they cause with phase and you can substitute the word timing for phase here. There's always engineering trade-offs so what's the downside? Well when it comes to the woofer, the woofer is pretty happy. You've set the crossover point at 1600 hertz even with a relatively gentle slope of say 6 or 12 dBs per octave it's not playing in a region where it's going to be adding a lot of distortion and those breakup nodes are going to become a problem. The issue is that you've also now got a gentle slope on a tweeter that's having to extend down quite low. You're placing a lot of demand on that tweeter and that could be a big problem. A solution could be to get a larger tweeter. Now that introduces a whole set of other problems that I won't get into here, but you get the general picture. You solve one problem in engineering and quite often you recreate another one. But what they've elected to do here is to put the tweeter in a waveguide. The waveguide effectively acts like an acoustic amplifier, boosting the low frequency performance of the tweeter. Problem solved. So why don't more manufacturers do this? Well, the issue is that waveguides are notoriously difficult to design. Amphion have been doing this for 20 years. Bukart went to great lengths to make sure that their waveguide worked effectively get it wrong and it's going to really mess up the response of the speaker but get it right and problem solved. Another benefit of a waveguide if designed right is that it controls the directivity of the tweeter in particular in the critical region where it hands over duties 
to the mid bass woofer. Now, what I need to explain is this, that the dispersion of a driver is directly related to its size. As a driver goes higher up its range, its dispersion narrows. Now, this is what's happening to the mid bass woofer, but then it's handing over to a tweeter, which is much smaller, and its dispersion is going to be wide at that point. So by placing that tweeter in the waveguide, what you're effectively doing is narrowing the dispersion of the tweeter at the crossover point to match the dispersion of the mid bass woofer. And by having that match across the tweeter and the mid bass woofer in terms of how they're dispersing sound, you get a much smoother off axis response. I compared the Amphion Argon Ones, a 1200 pound speaker, 1300 pounds in the walnut finish to a few speakers that I have here. First up was my PSB Imagine Minis, an excellent little mini monitor that retails for 600 pounds. Now both speakers have a fairly similar tonal balance, quite neutral, a touch on the lean side if anything. But the Argon Ones are comfortably quite a bit better. They're more dynamic, more extended in the bass. You'd expect that given the size, but they're also more open in the mid range. Both have fairly similar, nicely refined, nicely extended high frequency extension. I also did a comparison between the Argon ones and the Bucar S 400s that I have here at the moment. So I'm going to do a comparison between the passive S 400s and the active A 500s. Now the Bucar S 400s are a larger speaker with a larger mid bass woofer and that passive radiator at the back. And as a result, the bass extends deeper on the Bucarts and it has more weight, but the bass is faster and tighter on the Argon ones. And pretty much in every other respect, the Argon ones came up on top. The overall balance of the Argon ones is much more neutral. It's a little bit darker, a little bit more rolled off on the Buka S400s. The top end isn't as extended on the S400s as it is on the Argon ones. And there's a cleaner, faster presentation to the Argon ones compared to the S400s. So let's up the stakes a bit and compare the Argon ones to my long-term reference speaker, my Proac Response One SEs, the current version of which retails for around 2000 pounds. Now, Let's break this down in a little bit more detail. When it comes to bass, the bass response on the Argon ones was superior to my Proac Response One SCs. Both speakers are supposed to dig down to around 45 Hertz, but I always felt this was a little bit ambitious as far as my Proacs were concerned. The Argon ones did seem to dig down just a little bit further, but the bass was also faster and tighter on the Argon ones. It's quite remarkable considering is a ported design and it just goes to show that when a ported design is done right it can match the kind of fast tight articulate bass that you associate with a good sealed box or transmission line design. Now I'm going to talk about mid-range performance but I just want to set some expectations first. Since starting this channel all the speakers that I reviewed there's only been one speaker that's been able to match the mid-range performance of my Proact Response One SCs and that was the ATC SCM 19s. In fact, they were even a touch cleaner in their mid-range response, but they were also a lot more demanding of the partnering equipment that you use with them and the source material that you played. That's ultimately the reason why the ATCs went back and my Proax remained. But I'm not here to talk about the ATCs. Can the Amphion Argon ones compete with my Proact Response One SCs in the mid-range? And the answer is, uh, no. Listen, if you hadn't heard the ATCs or my Proax, you'd be perfectly happy with the mid-range response of the Amphion Argon Ones. It's just that the Proax have this way of delivering vocals and instruments in a way that feels very natural. It's all about texture and tone. And there's more space around the instruments when you're listening to it through the Proax. There's very little to tell the two speakers apart when it comes to high frequencies. Okay, in the upper mid range, the Proax are a little bit more refined and sibilance is a little bit better controlled, but both speakers are nicely extended. They're not bright, 
they're not rolled off and they have a nice airiness to the top end. Right, so I'm ready to talk about the Argon One's party trick. My Proact Response One SEs have a reasonable off-axis response, but you really do need to sit in the sweet spot. That sweet spot with the Argon Ones is massive in comparison. In fact, even if you move really close, far away, left or right, it's remarkable how little the tonal balance of the speaker changes and how coherent it sounds. And I have to put this down to the successful implementation of the waveguide. It was also a key feature of the Buka S400s. Now, in the sweet spot, granted, the Proax have a slightly wider, a slightly deeper soundstage, but it's no slouch on the Argon ones either. Do I need to say that if you've got a decent sounding speaker, get it away from walls unless it's specifically designed to work against walls? Because that's true of all speakers. Well, I suppose I've said it anyway. Now, that said, the Argon ones have a very fast, a very tight bass. So if you're placing them quite close to walls, they're not gonna boom quite as much as some other speakers may. What they are quite forgiving of is your position relative to the speakers. So if you can't create the ideal equilateral triangle with the two speakers and your listening position and you're listening further away or a little closer up because they're quite good in the near field as well, they're gonna be quite forgiving in that regard. And I also think they're gonna be quite forgiving of the kind of room that you place them in from an acoustic standpoint, whether it's lively room with lots of reflective surfaces or a dampened down room with lots of soft furnishings because it's a control directivity speaker and that's a key benefit of this type of design. This is a pretty easy speaker to drive. It works well with modest amplification, unlike my Proact Response One SCs that are a lot more demanding. It has a nominal impedance of eight ohms and a minimum impedance of five ohms. But more importantly, I don't think the impedance plot is likely to dart around that much and that's why you can drive the Argon ones off relatively inexpensive amplification. It has a sensitivity rating of 86 decibels, which is pretty typical of compact stand mount speakers of this size. But compared to other speakers which are larger and have a higher sensitivity rating, those are gonna be more suitable for people who listen at high levels or in large rooms. The IOTA VX SA3 is a 400 pound amplifier with 50 watts on tap. It's typically the kind of accessible amplifier that you could partner with the Argon ones and be quite happy with how it drove the speakers and the sound that you got. In fact, the combination reminded me of what a cracking little amplifier the IOTA is for the money. It sounded fast, clean and dynamic. Switching to the 1500 pound Hegel H95, the dynamics improved a little bit, the soundstage got a little bit wider. It's really the refinement of the Hegel and in particular the fullness in the mid-range that shone through. This is exactly the kind of amplifier you should be looking at to get the most out of the Argon ones. In fact, it's the same UK distributor for both brands and he regularly shows these two products together just to show what can be achieved at this price. My two and a half thousand pound Hegel H160 should move things up a gear again. That certainly was the case when I compared both Hegel amplifiers with my Proact Response One SCs, but the Argon ones didn't highlight so much differences between the two amplifiers. Yep, with the H160, the scale and dynamics improved as you'd expect, but the overall tonal balance I felt was better with the H95 and the Argon ones, and that's because the H95 has a slightly more full mid-range and I suppose it all comes down to system synergy. My Exposure 21 Pre and 18 Super Mono Blocks retailed for just over £3,000 22 years ago. I genuinely believe if they were being built today, they'd cost the best part of £5,000. Now if the synergy between the H95 and the Argon ones was good, the synergy between my exposures and the Argon ones was great. The speakers just simply disappeared and the texture and tones that were delivered were just glorious. Okay, I get it, a little bit overkill when it comes to amplification, but it's fun to try these things. 
Running a Hi-Fi review channel on YouTube is a lot more work than most people realize, but I can't complain too much, especially when you find real gems like this. It's the kind of stuff that gets you really excited, a product that most people aren't really aware of and that hasn't been reviewed that much. You can see where I'm going with this. In the Amphion Argon Ones, you have a speaker that retails for 1,200 pounds that competes with the finest speakers at 2,000 pounds. It's forgiving of partnering amplification and it's forgiving of the room. And it sounds fantastic for the money, a real bargain, comfortably and outstanding from this channel. So that's it for my review of the Amphion Argon Ones. Hopefully you've liked this review. If you have, please hit that like button. Please share this. And if you like my approach to hi-fi and you haven't subscribed already, please think about subscribing. But for today, for now, a British audiophile signing off.